Bible Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Today's chapel speaker is Dr. John Grassmick, who is our Vice President for Academic Affairs, Academic Dean, and serves as, pro as Professor of New Testament Studies here at Dallas Seminary. Dr. Grassmick has served on our DTS faculty since 1974, well over 30 years of faithful ministry. His uh, wife, Karen, has served in the administration on various administrations over the years, and she currently serves as my administrative assistant in the president's office. And Karen, you don't uh, often get introduced. Are you here this morning? I'm assuming you are. Would you stand? Thank you. John and Karen have four adult children and now seven grandchildren. Uh, it's been my privilege over the last number of years to work very closely with John in the administration. And when I think of John, he often introduces me, and I rarely get the opportunity to introduce him. But when I think of John, I think of uh, words like faithful. Uh, he is a faithful man in his character. Uh, he's thorough. Uh, he, he loves excellence, sets a high standard for himself and for others. And he's also a, a leader, and he's supportive as a team player. And when he comes to the table, it's never selfish. It's always what's good for the full institution. John, thank you for your faithfulness, not only over the years in New Testament studies, but especially over these last eight years in your present role. Thank you for your teamship, uh, your leadership, your friendship, your encouragement. But thank you for the model of faithfulness that you have been to our campus. Would you join me in welcoming a dear friend, a faithful colleague, John Grassmick. Last week I was on second floor of Todd Building and I noticed on Harold Honer's office door a sign that says, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. <clears throat> so I knocked on the door and I said, I would just like to see what Jesus' favorite looks like. And knowing Harold as I do as a friend and colleague, it gives me a new appreciation for God's grace. <laughs> One of the greatest achievements in American history was the manned moon landing in July of 1969. The scientists who engineered this lunar landing faced many challenges and obstacles. One of the most important was to prepare the astronauts to survive on the surface of the moon. Their goal was to train and equip these moon explorers to not only survive, but to accomplish their mission in an environment that would have otherwise killed them instantly. I remember with excitement as Karen and I watched this historic moment on television. Here these two highly trained, well-equipped engineers were bounding around on the surface of the moon like children on a trampoline. Not only did Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin survive, they also accomplished their mission. Their life support system sustained them and all the painstaking effort and training that they had gone through could not outweigh the moment when Neil Armstrong said, here's one step, one small step for man, but a giant step for mankind. Allow me to draw an analogy to the Christian life. Just as the scientists prepared earth dwellers to survive in the hostile environment of the moon, so God, through his word, equips believers, citizens of heaven, to live in the challenging and sometimes hostile environment of a fallen world. As you know from experience, God doesn't restructure our environment when we become Christians. He doesn't remove the conflicts and the pressures, the heartaches, the sickness, the sorrow, the suffering of everyday life. When you came to Dallas Seminary, you didn't enter a suffering-free zone. In fact, some of you may feel that your trials and troubles have intensified considerably. <laughs> the, 
The various requests for prayer during a semester makes us aware of the range of suffering that many experience in our seminary community. Romans 8 is a great chapter on the work of the Holy Spirit and Christian assurance, but it also says something about suffering. In verses 16 and 17 of this chapter, the Apostle Paul declares that the indwelling spirit confirms the wonderful reality that believers are the children of God. And since we are his children, we are his heirs also. In fact, we are co-heirs with Christ. That means we will share in the splendid treasures of eternal glory that God has given to his son, Jesus Christ. Glory is the totally satisfying beauty of living life in the presence of God with everlasting joy. It's a marvelous inheritance along with glorious new capacities prepared for us so that we can enjoy it forever. That's what it means to be glorified with Christ. But before we share in his glory, we must suffer with him. It's part of the total package, the necessary prelude to glory. In light of what Paul goes on to say, I I believe his reference to suffering with Christ is a broad one. It refers to all kinds of suffering, including persecution, all kinds of suffering that comes to Christians in a fallen world. It's all the pain, the trials, the, the opposition that Christians face and endure on the pathway to glory. And so the question comes, if we must suffer with Christ in order to be glorified with him and receive our inheritance, is it really worth it? And Paul writes Romans 8, 18 to 25, to say yes, yes, a thousand times yes, it's worth it. And these verses provide life support truth that deepens our hope and strengthens our faith and helps us endure the sufferings of life on the pathway to glory. Paul knew about suffering. All we need to do is review 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 28. He endured imprisonments, beatings, stoning, and shipwreck. He was the victim of robbery and treachery. He suffered hunger and thirst, cold and exposure, sleepless nights, and the general hassles of living everyday life. Paul knew what he was talking about from experience. But he also knew something else. God was pleased in an unusual way to give him a preview of heaven, a glimpse of glory to come that he mentions in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 6. He has seen the other side, and that qualifies him to speak with conviction in the here and now. And now you can feel the impact of verse 18 in Romans 8. Paul says this, For I consider, or in other words, it's my firm conviction that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That is, the glory that's in store for us. The very glory that he was privileged to preview. The pivotal word in this verse is worth. It derives from a verb that is used in the context of weighing things. It meant to draw down the scale with weights. What is Paul's perspective on present sufferings? In this text, he doesn't rename it and call it something else, like a blessing in disguise. He doesn't analyze it and try to explain why God allows it. He doesn't try to avoid it and retreat into isolation somewhere. Instead, he weighs suffering. He puts it on the scales of life in the here and now, and he shows that it carries no weight in comparison to the glory that awaits him. In effect, he says, when I weigh the present suffering, When I pile up all the ridicule and the anguish and the tragedy, the heartache, the sickness, the sorrow, and the hostility on one side of the scale, it will never draw down the scale of future glory piled up on the other side. And here's the point. The surpassing value of future glory with Christ far exceeds the pain of present sufferings here on earth. 
If there is one thing that equipped Paul and can equip us to live a God-honoring life in our earthly sojourn, it's the firm conviction that the pain of present sufferings, whatever they may be for you and for me, bear no comparison with the value of sharing life in the glorious presence of Jesus Christ forever. Paul wants us to have this perspective, even in the midst of our most crushing disappointment or trial. And so he provides further explanation. How does Paul know that the present sufferings don't outweigh future glory? He gives us a twofold explanation. The first explanation is found in verses 19 to 22. And I would like you to notice these verses. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him, a reference to God, who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. These verses tell us something very sad and at the same time something very wonderful about all creation. The something sad part takes us back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they fell under the curse and suffered the consequences of sin and rebellion. Part of God's judgment on humankind involved a curse on subhuman creation. In Genesis 3, 17 and 18, God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. It will produce thorns and thistles. And Paul refers to this in verse 20. The creation was subjected to futility. This was according to God's will and plan in response to sin. Since the fall, creation has been subjected to the service of mankind that often hinders its original purpose to glorify God. For that reason, creation is frustrated, subject to the abuse of sinful, self-serving humanity. All of nature is in slavery to corruption and suffers. Indeed, how our earth is suffering now from the exploitation of its resources to pollution, many times just to satisfy human self-serving pleasures and greed for more. People are concerned about global warming and going green to preserve our, to preserve our resources and to, and to reduce pollution. Not only that, we also experience earthquakes, hurricanes, flash floods, drought, and wildfires like we've experienced recently in California all evidence of the imbalance and frustration stirred up in nature. And these things remind us that we are not in control of these forces. According to scripture, the earth is suffering now through no fault of its own because of God's judgment on human sin. In light of this, John Piper makes this comment. The point of all the misery in the world its futility, its corruption, its groaning is to teach us the horror of sin against an infinitely holy God. And at the same time, the preciousness of redemption and hope. Futility, that's the sad part, but it's not the end of the story. The something wonderful part is picked up in the last two words of verse 20, the words, in hope. In God's plan, he never intended the earth's subjection to, to futility to go on forever. There is a future deliverance from its present suffering. And so in verse 19, Paul describes the subhuman creation as eagerly waiting, eagerly longing for something. When our children were young, they slept in a crib with side railings. And when our eldest daughter would wake up in the morning, she would stand up in the crib, and she would call out for daddy or mommy. We would often tiptoe quietly to the door of her bedroom and push it open a crack and peek inside. And as soon as she saw us, she would call out excitedly, 
stretch out her arms and lean as far forward on that railing as she could until one of us would pick her up. Moms and dads can identify with that picture of eager anticipation. That is what creation is doing, stretching out, eagerly waiting for the day when believers are glorified, when they are publicly displayed for who they truly are, sons and daughters of God, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the time when the curse of Genesis 3 will be lifted. Creation will be liberated from slavery to violence, pollution, and abuse in order to fulfill its original purpose. The earth will be restored to its Garden of Eden glory. According to Isaiah 11, wolves and lambs will lie down together. Children will be able to play with snakes. Weapons of warfare will be turned into farm implements. All because Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, rules and reigns on earth in his millennial kingdom and a new heaven and a new earth to follow. So in verse 22, Paul says that every part of creation is groaning and travailing in unison, not with death pangs, but with birth pangs, eagerly awaiting the end of her service to corruption and pollution in order to enter into the new order of freedom and glory. Paul, how do you know that the sufferings of this present time do not outweigh future glory? It's because the entire creation will experience its own future liberation from corruption. To have its Garden of Eden glory again far exceeds its present condition. But not only does creation long for glory, we believers do also. That introduces a second explanation in verses 23 to 25 in support of Paul's confident declaration back in verse 18. Look at these verses with me. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, and we do, we wait for it with steadfast endurance. With emphasis, Paul says, we ourselves, even we ourselves, just like crea creation, groan within ourselves. Usually we think of groaning in sort of a negative sense of either complaining or experiencing pain, but that's not the idea here. Instead, this groaning is a deep sigh of anticipation a longing for glory to be revealed to us, a longing for freedom from the presence of sin and its diabolical consequences. Why are Christians able to do this? It's because we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Viewed as an appositional phrase, we could translate the clause, we have the first fruits, namely the Spirit. First fruits was the name of a special feast day in ancient Israel. On that day, the priests would go out to the grain fields and they would mark out a small section in one corner of the field. The whole harvest couldn't be started until that section was harvested and offered to God. That small sample was the first fruits, the first installment and pledge of much more to come from the whole field. And Paul picks up that picture to make a theological point. Believers have the indwelling Holy Spirit as the first fruits of heavenly glory. The person and work of the Spirit who comforts and empowers us now is God's first installment and pledge of more glory to come. Ten-year-old Chris desperately wanted a bicycle for Christmas. His parents purchased one, but they were somewhat undecided as how to present it to him. And finally, they decided to take a clip from the handbrake cable, put it in a little box, wrap it up, and put it under the Christmas tree with all the other gifts. On Christmas morning, everyone was opening their presents. Chris was given the last present, this little box. He put it on his lap, opened it, and there's this silly little brake clip. What's this about? 
He tried to be happy, but obviously he was clearly disappointed. And he began to cry. And when his father couldn't hold on any longer, he put his arm around his son and said, Chris, this little clip belongs to something more. And then he took him out to the garage and showed him the whole Christmas package, a brand new bicycle. Well, on a much more significant level, we as Christians have the first fruits of glory already. It's a pledge of much more to come, namely our adoption as sons, that is, the resurrection of our body. This is the climax of salvation for which believers eagerly wait. This expectation shows that Christians live in an already not yet eschatological tension. Back in verses 14 to 17, Paul makes clear that the adoption as sons of God is already a present reality for Christians. While here in verse 23, its full expression is still future. The day we trusted Christ as Savior, we were adopted into God's family and became his children. But our sonship is still partial and incomplete. Though we already have the first fruits of glory in the indwelling spirit, we still live life in a mortal body, in a fallen world. We are still subject to finiteness, weakness, temptation to sin, suffering, and death because we are not yet recipients of the final element in our adoption. The redemption of our bodies and complete conformity to the likeness of Jesus himself. This physical body will be transformed into a glorious body, like the glorious body of our Lord, free from weakness, disease, decay, sin, and death. As the apostle John declares, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Meanwhile, we live with an appropriate sense of incompleteness in our present Christian experience. We long for the consummation of our salvation yet to come when we will be like our Savior and enjoy life in his presence totally free from suffering and sin. And that is why Paul can say in verses 24 and 25 that believers have been saved in hope. On one hand, hope for what is possessed already is not hope at all, because no one hopes for what he already possesses. On the other hand, since we hope for what we do not possess, the consummation of our salvation in glorification, we must eagerly wait for it with steadfast endurance. That's what it takes. Steadfast endurance in present suffering while eagerly longing for future glory. The astronauts of Apollo 11 were able to walk on the moon because they had been equipped to survive and succeed in that environment. All the painstaking hours of training were not worth comparing to that one great moment when they stepped on the surface of the moon. By the grace of God, believers are on the pathway to glory. Suffering attends that journey some of you are facing it today. Others have or yet will. It's a prelude to glory. This passage in Romans 8 provides life support truth for the journey. It gives us a biblical perspective that sustains us. Present sufferings are global, not merely individual. The whole creation groans, and we groan. Sufferings fit within the plan and purpose of an all-wise loving God for his people. Sufferings are temporary. The journey leads to magnificent glory, free from all suffering. With steadfast endurance in the midst of present sufferings, we eagerly long for glory to come. Don't abandon hope. Don't throw it away. Stand firm with Christ within and during the hardships and sufferings of this present time, it's worth it. A thousand times worth it. And along with Paul, may we equally have the same firm conviction, the surpassing value of future glory 
far exceeds the pain of present sufferings. Let's take a moment for prayer. Heavenly Father, give us a renewed understanding of this truth and profound experience of it in our lives. We thank you for the surpassing glory that you have promised to your people. And we pray that in the midst of present sufferings, we may have steadfast endurance, longing for the day when we are free in glory, in the very presence of God himself, enjoying it with everlasting joy. That's our prayer, that's our desire, that we lift up in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.